Let's try and explain what goes wrong with our patients, how we recognise what goes wrong with our patients and what we do about it to treat our patients. So first of all, let's think about a normal arterial lumen. Now an artery is in three layers. There's a relatively thin inside layer called the tunica intima. It's the inside layer, it's intimate. Then there's a thicker media, tunica media. Tunica means coat, of course, tunica media. This contains uh, a lot of smooth muscle with some elastic tissue and some collagen in the wall. Mostly it's smooth muscle cells with connective tissues. And round about we've got the adventitia, the outer layer of fibrous tissue connecting the artery to the surrounding adjacent tissues. So three layers, tunica intima, tunica media, on the outside the tunica adventitia. And of course the whole purpose of an artery is that it's the tube. We need the hole down the middle. This is called the lumen. So we need a patent arterial lumen through which blood can go to perfuse the tissues that this artery anatomically supplies with blood. The adventitia is made of connective tissue. We've mentioned that the inside middle layer, the media layer, is elastin, collagen and smooth muscle. The intima is mostly endothelial cells. Well, it's all endothelial cells. It's just a flat sheet of endothelial cells. Flat, smooth, squamous cells, so the blood can flow over without any turbulence or without any resistance. And there's a very old saying in healthcare that you're as fit as your arteries, and it's largely true. If you've got good arteries, if your tissues are being well perfused, you're likely to be in reasonable health. Or if you think about this in terms of another diagram we've used before, here's the artery. Arteries, of course, divide and bifurcate into smaller arterial vessels. And an arterial vessel supplies an area of tissue like this with blood. So the idea is that this arterial lumen is supplying this area of tissue here. This area of tissue. This arterial lumen is supplying this area of tissue. And of course the arteries divide and subdivide eventually down into arterioles the arterioles are taking blood into the capillaries where there's gaseous exchange and exchange of nutrients and all the physiology you're probably familiar with. Now, to understand atheroma, we need to know, look at a little more detail about the endothelial, the vascular endothelial layer. And it is just that, it's a layer of endothelial cells. So here we have the inner layer of endothelial cells. Squamous epithelial cells, each with their own nucleus cytoplasm cell membrane. And underneath this, we've got the smooth muscle cells of the tunica media. So a much larger magnification diagram now. So the lumen would be in here. This is where the blood's going through. This is one wall of the arterial vessel. The tunica intima, the tunica media, and there'd be an adventitia on the outside down here somewhere. 
Now, risk factors are going to alter the nature of this vascular endothelium. And risk factors can increase the permeability of this vascular endothelium and they can increase its stickiness. They can make it sticky. This is supposed to be Teflon coated. Nothing's supposed to stick to it. But exposure to risk factors, high fat diet, diabetes mellitus, smoking cigarettes, dyslipidemia, can alter the nature of the vascular endothelium. So let's take one example. If you eat a lot of polysaturated fats, the liver is obliged to make lots of low density lipoproteins to transport that fat around, meaning that the LDL levels in the blood are increased. You get more of these low density lipoproteins in the blood. And that combined with alterations to the nature of the vascular endothelium means that some of these lipoproteins can migrate in to and under the tunica, the tunica intima. So you end up with LDL cholesterol that's migrated through the altered vascular endothelium into this sub endothelial area. And if it spends time there, it will become oxidized. The LDL will become oxidized. And the key thing to grasp about this is oxidized low density lipoprotein is recognized as being foreign. The immune system considers this to be non self material, foreign material. If there's foreign non self material, that's going to be recognized by the immune system, which is going to seek to eradicate that non self material. And of course, this makes perfect sense. If there's non self material called bacteria, we need the immune system to eradicate it to prevent infection and to prevent sepsis. So, what happens is White blood cells, mostly monocytes, will start to first roll along the vascular endothelium. Then they will actually adhere to the vascular endothelium. Because remember we said the vascular endothelium has become sticky. Risk factors can cause the vascular endothelium to express adhesion molecules. It actually becomes sticky and the monocytes will stick to the cell membrane. So first to, to the cell membranes of the vascular endothelium. So first of all, they'll roll along the side of it, then they'll stick to it, and then there's a process called diapodesis, bit of a long word, but what it means is the white blood cells will squeeze through the gaps in the vascular endothelium. They will actually squeeze through and you'll end up with macrophages in this subendothelial space. What are the macrophages after? Well, obviously they're after the foreign material. The macrophages are only doing their job. There's foreign material here, time to get rid of that foreign material. So what we have now is the, another diagram, here's the vascular endothelium. And we've ended up with low density lipoproteins, oxidized LDL, and macrophages that have come into phagocytos to get rid of this foreign material, which is their job. And they do so. They phagocytose the low density lipoproteins. And what that means is the macrophages get bigger, And because they've oxidized all this fatty, low density cholesterol, you end up with macrophages, which are bloated and full of fatty, 
low density cholesterol. In this state, we refer to them as foam cells. So the macrophages are now foam cells. Over time, some of these macrophages are going to die. And when they die, that means that the low density lipoproteins and fatty material that the macrophages contain will be released into the subendothelial space. And you'll start getting pools like little puddles of cholesterol. This fatty material is now starting to accumulate underneath the endothelium. And at this stage, if you were to look at the lining of this vessel, it would look streaked. There is streaking in early atherosclerosis. And this streaking can occur at a remarkably young age, especially if there's risk factors present. This was firstly identified after the tragic deaths of young American servicemen in the Korean War. Just young guys, late teens, early 20s. And uh, when they did post-mortems on them, looked at the inside of their arteries, and already this streaking was quite significant in some cases. Also, if someone's got diabetes, then sugar can migrate into the subendothelial space. And when sugar combines with tissues and proteins, what we say is that it is glycolated or glycosylated. So it's possible to get glycosylated proteins in the subendothelial space as well as a result of ongoing hyperglycemia. And glycosylated proteins are also recognized as being foreign. Glycosylated program, um, proteins will also attract macrophages. They will go in and phagocytose the glycosylated proteins as well. And because the glycosylated proteins in the LDLs are foreign, initiating a, an immune reaction, there's inflammation. So it's quite fair to say that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory process. Inflammatory cells are coming into the area and accumulating in the area. And as we've seen here, we're starting to get pools of lipids forming. Now let's draw another diagram. So here we've got some atheroma that's uh, developing. Here's a pool of atheroma in the sub-endothelial space. And we know that lying over this there's going to be the endothelial cells of the tunica intima. And we know that underneath the endothelium, there's going to be the smooth muscle cells of the tunica media, which are here. Because, of course, the media is below the intima. So that's as we would expect. Now, when there's macrophages here, underneath the endothelium, and maybe small pools of cholesterol are starting to accumulate, I think you can see there's now a lot of material here which shouldn't be there. And that can result in macrophages, which are now foam cells, pushing out through the vascular endothelium. In other words, they're now in the lumen of the blood vessel because this is the lumen of the blood vessel here. 
maybe just separate these diagrams. That was the top diagram. This is the this is the middle diagram. So in the lumen here, there's going to be blood cells passing, and in particular, there's going to be platelets. The platelets will recognise the foam cell as not supposing to be there and you'll start to get some platelet aggregation. Not enough to cause any clinical features, but just a little bit. But the thing is that platelet aggregation is going to cause the platelets to release platelet growth factor. So at an early stage, we can get completely subclinical aggregation of platelets and platelets releasing platelet growth factor. Also, the macrophages themselves themselves release cytokines. You probably remember that cytokines are chemical messengers that go from one cell to another cell. They're like very short range hormones really. So we've got the release of platelet derived growth factors and we've got the release of other growth factors from the macrophages Remember, this macrophage is now a foam cell, isn't it? We've got the release of growth factors. So this area now has platelet-derived growth factor and macrophage-derived cytokine growth factor in this area. Well, why is that? Well, the cytokines and growth factor affect these smooth muscle cells in the tunica media and amazingly what they do is they stimulate stimulate mitosis in these cells so you get more of them and the growth factors and cytokines also stimulate the migration of these cells and they start to migrate over the what we can now call an atheromatous plaque they migrate over that and cover it. And this defense mechanism is even more amazing than that because the, the actual nature of these smooth muscle cells changes to a different phenotype. They become a different type of tissue really. And they become uh, non-stretchy and non-contractile. And what they do is they're forming a cap between the thrombus or the thrombogenic core down here and the blood out there. Because that's the key thing to grasp about these atheromatous plaques. They're thrombogenic. If platelets come into contact with the atheromatous plaque, that will cause platelet aggregation and the initiation of thrombus formation. If the blood passing by out here is completely separated from the thrombogenic plaque, then you're not going to get thrombosis. And these new cells facilitate that division. They keep them apart. So you end up with a few layers of these smooth muscle cells over the top forming a fibrous cap. And actually if we were to look at some of these cells in more detail, if these are the cells overlying the atheromatous plaque, So here on the outside we would have the vascular endothelium here and the area of atheroma down here. What these cells actually do is they develop collagen cross bridges. Which bind the smooth muscle cells with their altered phenotype together and form a fibrous cap. 
So the platelets and blood cells passing by on the outside, there's a red blood cell here, some platelets. They're separated from the thrombogenic core of the plaque by the fibrous cap of the plaque made up of the smooth muscle cells held rigidly together by collagen cross linkages meaning the platelets on the outside are nowhere near the thrombogenic core of the plaque and we would call this a stable plaque so a stable plaque is typified by plenty of smooth muscle cells good numbers of collagen cross-linking stabilizing the roof of the plaque and an intact vascular endothelium meaning the thrombogenic core is completely isolated from the platelets and the clotting factors circulating in the blood this gives rise to a stable plaque this is a stable situation but of course it's still pathological we still have atheroma now maybe we can use this diagram to illustrate the significance of atheroma the atheroma develops progressively over time maybe it starts as very thin streaking but then it develops and it tends to occur at bifurcations where arteries bifurcate so here we're getting some developing atheroma and over the years exposure to the risk factors it's going to get more extensive so here for example we have some atheroma now in the past when this individual was young the arterial lumen supplying blood to this area was from there to there now it's only from there to there there's a narrowed lumen And this will give rise to the first clinical feature of atheroma, which is ischemia. Ischemia being a reduced blood supply to the tissues. So there's going to be a reduced blood supply to this area. But in this individual at the moment, I'm pleased to say that these plaques are stable. The vascular endothelium is intact. There's a layer of smooth muscle cells that have migrated over the top of the atheromatous plaques. The smooth muscle cells are held together with a matrix of collagen cross-linking. There's an intact fibrous cap. Even although there's a thrombogenic core, the blood is kept well away from it. But the plaque is physically present, so this area is going to be ischemic. Now, most of the time that might be okay. There's enough blood getting through here to supply this area of myocardium. But then maybe the person starts exercising. And when they exercise, that's going to increase the metabolic demand of this area of the myocardium. It's going to increase its oxygen requirement. But the narrowed blood supply, because the lumen is narrowed, the blood supply is reduced. The ability of that much blood, because there's a narrowed lumen, there's less blood getting through, the blood that's getting through can't deliver enough oxygen so during exertion this area becomes comparatively hypoxic when the hypoxia reaches a certain level as you probably know the aerobic metabolism changes to anaerobic metabolism with anaerobic metabolism there's going to be the production of i think you know this lactic acid presence of the lactic acid in the tissues is going to give rise to the pain of myocardial ischemia but this only happens when the metabolic demand of the myocardium exceeds the ability of the blood to oxygenate that area of the myocardium this patient has stable angina of effort and that's one manifestation of coronary arterial atherosclerosis because remember we're talking about the coronary arteries here 
this tissue is myocardium. So the first clinical feature, ischemia. But the next is thrombus formation, the next complication. Now, if for any reason the clot becomes destabilized, then blood can come into contact with the thrombogenic core. So what do we mean by this? Well, inflammatory processes, for example, in this area here, in the roof of the cap, inflammatory processes mean that there's going to be inflammatory cells, such as macrophages and other white blood cells. And one of the things that the white blood cells do is they can release collagenases. Collagenases are enzymes that can digest collagen. Because as you know, white blood cells are phagocytic. They ingest foreign material and they need enzymes to digest and break down and kill that foreign material. That, that's their business. That's what they do. But if there's a lot of inflammatory cells in the area, there's inflammatory processes going on, then some of these enzymes are going to be released and some of these enzymes are collagenases and other proteases, enzymes that will digest protein. So what this means is we have three digestive enzymes, proteases, collagenases in the area of the fibrous cap and these will dissolve the cross linkages and they will also digest the cells to some extent. These inflammatory processes with the release of the enzymes are destroying the normal protective fibrous cap. Now the smooth muscle cells will try and divide and recover so the mitosis in the smooth muscle cells is promoting plaque stability and the inflammatory processes are reducing plaque stability and when the inflammatory processes start winning you're going to end up with ulcerations in the plaque or fissures in the plaque. The plaque has changed from being a stable plaque to being an unstable plaque. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that statins are so useful. Statins, yes, we know they reduce LDL cholesterol, but statins also are, appear to be anti-inflammatory and statins improve plaque stability. So even although someone may have atherosclerotic plaques, if those plaques are stable, hopefully they're not going to get thrombus as a complication. But if this plaque becomes unstable enough, I think you can see now that this area is ulcerated. This means that platelets in the blood are going to come into contact with the lipid rich thrombogenic core and that can start the platelet aggregation and clotting process. So what does this mean in terms of the acute coronary syndrome? Well, let's go back to this diagram and try and explain that. So let's imagine that we have a blood vessel here and here's the atheromatous plaque in the wall of the blood vessel. This is one side and here's the intima. So this situation here there's the wall of the blood vessel there and the other wall of the blood vessel there, the plaque and the lumen in the middle. This is rather analogous to the diagram above, in fact. I have a colour that in green, so it's atheroma, the same colour. So what we've got here is like a blow-up diagram of what we have up here in this diagram. There's areas of atheroma But it's a stable area of atheroma because of the intact fibrous cap. 
But if that destabilizes due to the inflammatory processes, we're going to end up with fissuring or ulceration of the fibrous cap, meaning that the platelets in the blood can come into contact with the thrombogenic core. This core is going to contain a certain amount of collagen, which stimulates platelet aggregation. Macrophages actually produce something called tissue factor, which is pro-thrombogenic, which promotes coagulation. And what we're going to end up with is initially platelet aggregation. So the acute coronary syndrome is where a stable plaque becomes thrombogenic, giving rise to the second complication of atheroma, which is thrombosis. Remember we said the first complication of atheroma was ischemia, the second is thrombosis. So when the plaque destabilizes, platelet aggregation is going to occur. And this plate aggregation pathologically appears as white thrombus. White thrombus, it's the platelets aggregating. And now quite a few platelets have aggregated as a result of disruption of the destabilized atheromatous plaque. And I think you can see now that these platelets are taking up more of the lumen. So the whole lumen should be from there to there. That should be the whole lumen from there to there. That would be the healthy lumen. There's already been some ischemia from there to there, but now we've got lots of platelets. So now the lumen has got even smaller. The, plate, the, the lumen has become even smaller. And we've got an acute coronary syndrome now because we've got an acute intravascular thrombus developing. And you might even get some distalization, some bits of thrombus might be washed off downstream. So if we relate this diagram to the one above now, we've now got some platelet aggregation around about the disrupted atheromatous plaque. And that's going to further reduce the blood supply to this area. This area is going to become even more ischemic. And that's going to cause unstable angina. So the presence of white thrombus is going to cause unstable angina. This tissue is going to become anaerobic, lactic acid is going to be produced, and the patient will suffer the clinical features of myocardial ischemia, the severe central heavy chest pain, probably radiating to the left side, occasionally radiating to the right side, maybe radiating up into the neck and jaw, maybe radiating down into the epigastric area, heavy crushing pain, just like in a in stable angina, because it's caused by a reduced blood supply. But now, the anaerobic metabolism, the hypoxia, is not caused by increased metabolic demand of the myocardium. It's caused by reduced blood supply to that area of the myocardium as a result of increased lumen diminution, redu reduction in the size of the lumen, as a result of the white thrombus. Now, just before we go on, it's important to note that in acute coronary syndrome, there need not be a history of an, uh, angina pectoris. In fact, most times there isn't a history of angina pectoris. Very often, the, le the lesion which destabilizes, the area of atheroma which becomes unstable, was previously insignificant. In other words, what we're saying is acute coronary syndrome can be the presentation of coronary arterial atherosclerosis. It can be the first thing the patient knows about it because the plaque was previously clinically insignificant. Other times patients do have a history of angina, but many times, many times they don't. The destabilizing plaque and the thrombus is the first thing. So when the patient rests with stable angina, the pain will pass off. 
But when the patient rests with acute coronary syndrome, because of this partial occlusion that we see here on the, the blown up diagram, because of the partial occlusion, there's reduced blood supply. And when the patient rests, because the ischemia is caused by the presence of this, this thrombus, the pain doesn't pass off. So the pain lasts for more than 20 minutes. Indeed, the pain can get worse. There can be what you call a crescendo angina as the pain gets worse because the ischemia distal to this partial obstruction becomes worse. So this situation is the first presentation of the acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina. Now, in this area of myocardium, which is hypoperfused as a result of the unstable angina, there's going to be lactic acid and hydrogen ions causing the pain. But the ischemia is not going to be enough to actually cause myocardial necrosis. There's not going to be actual infarction of the myocardium. Because the other name for unstable angina is troponin negative acute coronary syndrome. Now, if the infarction is severe, well, there's not an infarction now, but if there is a, a, a diminution in blood supply enough to cause an infarction, you actually get the release of troponins. But in unstable angina, you don't get the release of troponins because there's not a complete occlusion. It's an acute coronary syndrome, which is troponin negative. But let's suppose this situation is not treated by you, and it goes on getting worse, and more and more white thrombus develops. Well, now, OK, there might be tiny bits of blood getting through, but now the situation is worse because there's more thrombus. The lumen is more occluded. Even less blood, if any, now is getting through to the distal tissues. Probably mostly white thrombus. There might be a little bit of red thrombus here, but largely it's just white thrombus still. And in this situation, the reduction to the area of myocardium is greater. And the reduction of blood supply to the area of myocardium is so great that some of the myocytes will now start to die. They will now start to die. In other words, there'll be myocardial necrosis. In other words, the coronary thrombosis is now sufficiently severe to cause a myocardial infarction. But the reduction in blood supply to the myocardium is not sufficient to cause ST changes. So yes, there will be release of troponins into the blood from infarcted necrosed myocardial cells. But no, there will not be enough damage to the myocardium to cause ST changes. There won't be enough, but there will be troponins. And troponins are cardiac markers. Now, you probably know that in a myocardial cell, there's contractile tissues, thick bands, and thin bands. And how a muscle contracts, these are actin and myosin strands, aren't they? The actin and myosin strands. How a muscle actually contracts is these strands pull together. The actin and myosin strands pull together reducing the size of the cell, and that's what causes contraction. Now, the troponins are associated with the actin component of this. So there's troponins in here like this. This is where the troponins live physiologically. They regulate the part of the, they, they regulate contraction of the actin and myosin strands. So normally the troponins associated with the actin filaments are tucked up inside the cell there. But if the blood supply to this cell is reduced sufficiently, as we're describing now in the non-STEMI situation, the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction situation, what that means is this cell 
dies, there's necrosis. When the cell dies, the membrane becomes disrupted and the troponins will simply leak out. And you will get an increase in the number of troponins in the blood. The troponins are supposed to be inside the myocytes. When the myocyte dies, the troponins are released into the blood. And the more myocytes that die, the greater the level of troponins in the blood. So a small infarction, you'll get low levels of troponins. A big infarction, you'll get higher levels of troponins. So the first level of the acute coronary syndrome is troponin-negative unstable angina, where you get anaerobic changes causing pain, but you don't get actual myocardial necrosis. The second level of severity in the acute coronary syndrome, if you haven't intervened, is non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, where the necrosed myocardium will release troponins, but the necrosis is not sufficiently big enough or extensive enough to cause ST changes. So we're at this stage here with extensive white thrombus. But the platelet aggregation, if you still haven't intervened, could go on and start causing proper red blood clot. And this will work back until you get a whole area of coronary artery completely occluded with proper red blood clot. So to extend that to this diagram, the white thrombus becomes red thrombus and can completely block off certainly this artery and can actually work back. And that will completely block off the arterial branch. These things actually end up looking like slugs when you suck them out. There's like a big long piece of red blood clot. And that will completely infarct that area. Without you treating it, it will die completely. There will be the pain that you would expect with acute coronary syndrome, of course. There will be troponins because of the myocardial necrosis. And there is now enough infarction to cause ST elevation. This is now a STEMI, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. And we can actually use this way of thinking to illustrate the treatments as well. And it, it's good to use the A, B, C, D, E approach to treatment. So at an early stage, we want to give antiplatelets like aspirin and chlorpidogrel to stop the platelets from sticking together, preventing more white thrombus from forming, stopping the acute coronary syndrome developing from unstable angina through to non-STEMI through to STEMI. We're stopping it at that, hopefully at that stage. So antiplatelet drugs can prevent the platelets from sticking together. Anticoagulants such as heparin or other anticoagulants can prevent the formation of the red blood clot. So antiplatelets and anticoagulants are good. This explains why they're good. We can reduce the oxygen demand of the myocardium with bed rest and beta blockers. That's the B stage, bed rest and beta blockers. Also explains why those treatments are good. Beta blockers, of course, can only be given if the patient's blood pressure can, is sufficiently high enough to tolerate that. We can partly relieve the ischemia by giving GTN to dilate the coronary arteries. That's the C stage, that's the coronary artery vasodilators. Because of the extreme pain, that leads us on to the D stage, which is diamorphine. Or morphine, something to re reduce the pain and reduce the patient's level of anxiety. E stands for enough oxygen. 
Many patients presenting with an acute coronary syndrome have adequate oxygen saturations above 94% and we don't need to give extra oxygen. Because if we give extra oxygen, that can increase the free radicals in the ischemic and infarcted area of myocardium, potentially making the infarction and the insult to the myocardium worse. But the most important part of ST elevation myocardial infarction is that we get rid of this blood clot. We need to get rid of the blood clot to reperfuse the myocardium. Now it's going to take the myocardium some time to die, some hours to die. So the quicker we can take this blood clot out, the less myocardium will die. And with an ST elevation myocardial infarction, we can assume it's caused by red thrombus. And the best thing to do is PCI, percutaneous coronary arterial intervention revascularization, and just suck that out and then put in a stent. That's the best thing to do. If you can do it quickly. Because remember, in this situation, time is muscle. We have to intervene quickly. If PCI is not available, then we can give drugs to thrombolyze this to break up the red blood clot. Thrombolytic agents are fibrinolytic. So in a blood clot, we're going to have red blood cells here. And in a blood clot, these are held together by fibrin strands. Some people call it fibrin. You might remember that there's fibrinogen in solution in the plasma. And when there's blood coagulation, that's converted to fibrin. The fibrinolytic will dissolve these, thereby breaking up the blood clot. So the fibrinolytic, they'll break up the fibrin, and that will cause thrombolysis. They will break up the thrombus. Take away the thrombus, and the blood can flow freely again rescuing this area of myocardium. And of course, the quicker you do that, the better. So that's just a few ideas on the normal anatomy, the pathophysiology of acute coronary syndrome, explaining why we get the clinical features of atherosclerosis, why we get the clinical features of acute coronary syndrome, helping us to understand what goes wrong in our patients, and also informing the treatments that these patients require from you as an absolute life-saving emergency measure.